Welcome everyone to my dev talk on functional reactive programming with CycleJS. Uh, it's a little bit impromptu, so bear with me if there's any, any rough parts. Um, <laughs> Michael knows exactly what to expect when I say things like that. Yeah, so, have some slides. Oh yeah, uh, ask questions like, at any point. This is, this was, I have five days of experience with this framework, so I still remember what it felt like to not know what on earth any of this is. So, ask questions and yeah, it'll be great. So, what are we going to talk about today? What on earth is functional reactive programming? What is CycleJS? How does it compare to things like React? And why are you here? And why do you care at all? So, and I'm also going to like run through the cycle example. I'm probably just going to build the stuff in their example app because that was the part where I went from being like, this sounds ridiculous to, oh my god. Yeah, so I stole Wikipedia's super dry definition for functional reactive programming. I'm not going to read that. It contains the words functional and reactive programming too many times. Come on in, Van. Um, pretty much functional reactive programming is an entirely different paradigm of programming compared to the like traditional ones that we would normally work with, like imperative programming. And so functional programming, I'll just quickly define for anyone who hasn't really, um, I'm assuming I'm just going to go for it. Functional programming is pretty much um, a way of programming where you think about like things in terms of data and functions as opposed to like objects and instructions. So uh, you come across this in Ruby when you use tools, innumerable tools like map and select and filter and reduce. Those are all like functional ideas. Ruby's um, block syntax, the fact that you can pass functions into a block and it's like done in a relatively first class way, those are all very functional ideas. Reactive programming is pretty much this idea of like when we're working in client-side JavaScript, a lot of the time we're working with um, asynchronous event sources. So that sounds a little bit scary, but you can think about it in terms of like, when a user clicks on a button, that is, that is an event. And the state of our application at any given time is like changed by users performing events and stuff. So functional reactive programming is pretty much a way of working with those event streams, those asynchronous event streams, using like functional primitives like map and reduce and filter and stuff. And it pretty much means that um, you don't need to think so much about like how is my application going to get from starting out to like you know going through all of these instructions, doing the things, modifying the global state until everything is the way you want it to be, and more thinking about like I have this data, how can I transform it in like a purely functional way so that I can like get my application state. So what is CycleJS? CycleJS is a JavaScript library. It hit 1.0 last week, so we're living on the bleeding edge here. This is a bad idea, you probably shouldn't use this technology, just, just putting it out there. I'm crazy, so I am. Um, it's a really thin abstraction on top of this thing called RxJS, which is short for uh, ReactiveX JavaScript. Um, and ReactiveX is like this pattern of observables, which is like totally cross-language. You'll find it come up everywhere um, if you that really good documentation on ReactiveX.io that has like all the different things. But yeah, uh, what, what, are, what are observables? That is the real interesting part of CycleJS. Observables are a way of representing asynchronous event streams as an object effectively, an object that you can perform functional operations on. Um, that might seem a little bit abstract, but I'm just going to roll with that. What yeah, so Cycle, um, it's kind of a weird thing because it's the closest technology I can liken it to is React.js. Uh, React is really, really cool because it pretty much has this idea of like, you render your application once, you start with your state, you render your application once, you write code that renders once, and then every time your application state changes up here, React will re-render your application, figure out what's changed, and then apply the changes in a really performant way. And it's really amazing because it means that you don't need to think about how do I transition from this application state to this application state. You just write your application so that it renders once and then you don't need to worry about it. However, React is, and Facebook themselves say, React is the V in MVC. It is the view technology and it is very specifically just for doing view stuff. It doesn't handle anything like how do I get from my users clicking buttons to things changing inside of my application. You can do that just with React, but I think that that's where you start to see that React isn't quite as single responsibility, React functional as it might be. Um, Cycle is much more of an idea than it is actually a piece of technology that you should bother caring about. The actual library itself is only like 600 lines of code on top of, um, on top of Reactive X. And it's pretty much a way of thinking about building applications um, at like a very basic paradigm level. Why should you care? So I kind of touched on a little bit of this already, but pretty much um, the name of the game is that state is the enemy. 
in your applications. Like w pretty much the worst part of being a programmer nowadays is managing the complexities of state in your application and transitioning between, especially when it comes to client-side applications in the browser, transitioning between different states of your application and responding to things in an asynchronous way. It's really hard to like linearly force the like asynchronous event pattern into like a very easy to understand like way of thinking about things. Functional reactive programming lets you work with asynchronous event streams in such a way that you don't need to try and like wrangle it into a imperative instruction based mindset. It's much more just like you can express how your application should be based on what you started with and it's like when I first looked at it, I was like, I just have no idea what on earth this is. I still couldn't trace the code execution through a CycleJS app properly, but I like once I started wrapping my brain around the fundamental paradigm shift, it was just like, oh my god, this is amazing. Uh, I can't really stress that it's really fun enough. Like I've just really been enjoying this. Yeah. So now I'm going to dig into the example stuff. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Great. Everyone knows everything I've been talking about. That's awesome. Okay, so functional unidirectional data flow. It's what we all came here to learn about, right? No, okay. Uh, this is actually the core idea inside the cycle, and it seems like really strange when you first get it. Like I just did not understand what they were talking about in terms of human and computer interactions. But um, there's this really great idea somewhere in the cycle thing. I'm not going to bother finding the particular graph, but they talk about how MVC is a way of um, effectively creating a metaphor for both how the user thinks about the state of the application and how the computer thinks about the state of the application and how those two things interact. So in MVC, you can think about the V in terms of the user's mental model of the application. So that is your view, that is the HTML that you're sending down from your Rails application. And if you think about it in terms of like, you go onto the PowerShop website, when you go onto like the shop, we send down a whole bunch of HTML with images and products and stuff that tells the user, like this is the state your account's in, these are all the products and stuff. And the way that the user interacts with that is by clicking on things and it sends requests up to our server. And then we get into like the model and controller thing. And that's really like, we take the intent of the user and then we translate, we change the state of the application on the server and then we give like the current state of the application back to the user. But Cycle really gets into this idea of thinking about you can divide the human and the computer parts of your application and humans um, effectively have things that they want the computer to do. The computer has to make the change and the computer makes that change and it changes what the user sees. So you kind of have this cycle going on almost, which is, yeah. So um, I'm just going to start building the, like, going through the really basic things. We'll, we'll do our first cycle app. I'm just going to, I think I have one here, actually. Um, I committed, I went through the examples on the weekend, and I committed everything along the way. So we can go through that, but I do want to type it out. So, do do do. Let me just bring this up. This is what a cycle app looks like. Is that code big enough? Yeah, sweet. Make it bigger? Okay, cool. Switch. That's as big as we get with that screen real estate. Um, cool. So we can see this is rendering in the browser at the moment. There's a couple of different things going on here. <sighs> Sorry for people with glasses. Yeah. <laughs> um, so pretty much, like, yeah, so there are a couple of different things going on. Start at the bottom, like any good program, or we can start at the top. This is JavaScript. This is uh, ES6 um, using the ES6 module syntax, which uh, is then being, like, browserified and transformed and stuff, but it just it just turns into normal JavaScript on the end. So um, I've installed Cycle using npm install at Cycle for npm install at Cycle web. They're just like as as Cycle as it says. Cycle is just an architectural pattern, and Cycle core and Cycle web are just tools to help you build applications in a cycle. So we have this main function. I'm just going to delete this for a second. Um, so we have this main function, and the main function takes in um, responses, and I think it returns requests. And um, pretty much, like, this is our entire application when it really comes down to it. It is a loop that is called over and over again, and the result of the main function is passed back into the main function. Which seems kind of strange, but, like, that's, you're just going to have to live with that for the moment. So, if I put that back in there, um, let's break this down a little bit more. So, we have this cycle.rx.observable.just false. Now, that's, like, a really strange-looking piece of code just there. But pretty much what this returns is an observable that will just emit false once. And so an observable, if I didn't really properly define that earlier, you can think about it as an array of events that happen asynchronously throughout time. So it's a series of ordered events that happen at some point in time, and you can use it in such a way that you can perform functional operations on it. 
So in this case, we have this observable that just spits out false once. And so we map over it, which seems kind of strange because it's just one thing and we just have one thing coming out, but that's just like the way, the way it's going to be. Everyone's just going to have to deal with that. Um, I'm going to undo this a little bit because it makes me sad. Okay, so um, this syntax here will probably also look really strange. Uh, it is called, uh, it's virtual hyperscript and it comes in from Cycle Web. You can see this H thing here. It's literally effectively just the Rails like uh, tag helper thing. It, it just makes some HTML. And um, yes, it's awful. We have HTML in our JavaScript. Once again, deal with it. So this is on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we have a div, we have, um, and it has children. We have an input that has a type of checkbox and text to toggle me. We can see that there. Yeah, totally. And so React, of course, has the JSX syntax as well. And you can also get JS a thing that lets you use JSX and it compiles down to virtual hyperscript. Um, yeah. And we have this um, P and there's a ternary here. So if toggled is true, it will return on. And if it's not, it will return false. So we can see that by changing this to true. Um, oh, I've got this sweet thing where I should not, it should just automatically reload. It's not doing it, of course. Sweet, so that's his on. It's not very reactive though, because I don't have to change the code to get there. So let's make this actually work. Um, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna go through the, the example, because I can just do this or I can do it properly. Um, you know it's a good dev talk when they start reading the docs, eh? Do, do, do. So we do this in here. Sweet, so we have our checkbox app that is just false. So we want to change it so that like, we need to somehow um, take the event stream that we get by uh, like clicking on that input and turn it into something that when we map over it, it will give us true if we've clicked on it and like false, if, well, true if it's selected and false if it's not. So currently we're using observable.just and we're mapping over it. But what we can do is um, pretty much main takes in this, as I said earlier, this responses object. And so this is pretty much um, a way of thinking about like how the computer is, this is the computer's response for the current state of the application is the way that you can think about it. Uh, so what we can do with that is responses has this um, DOM thing inside of it. So we can go responses dot DOM, and this is really just like jQuery style, we can get some stuff. So I'm going to, um, this is effectively dot on, so I'm going to say when the input changes, um, I can map over, that'll give me an observable that is a series of events. If I map over that and return whether or not the event target was checked, which will be either true or false, then it will spit that out. So we can try that. That's not going to work, but it's an interesting reason why. So, um, it seems like that should work and that we have this like response to some get and then we're turning it into true false. But um, we have to actually put this thing in, which is really strange as well, start with. And that pretty much like kicks off the loop of the interaction. It pretty much says the initial starting state of this observable is false. And without that, we don't really have a way of actually like knowing. So now when we click on it, it goes on off, which is sweet. Um, I will just log that out so that we can see what's actually kind of going on there. So, um, <laughs> so, or not. Yeah, so when we click on that, you can see it spits out true or false down there. So let's just recap that really quickly. We have um, this responses.dom.get thing that returns an observable, which is a stream of like events when, you know, the click event, just exactly the same as if you did a jQuery.on input change and then you pass in an event handler. The only difference is that we are like performing functional operations on the stream. So it goes from being a bunch of events, we can, if we dot map, log that, then we can log out the events and we can actually see that those are just normal browser events. Uh, if that worked. Yeah, so you can see change, it's got a target, it's trusted, current target, I don't really know what you get out of events, but it's just normal browser stuff. Yeah, just normal browser stuff, yeah, totally. Um, sweet. So that's kind of like a really trivial example in that it doesn't have any state at all. It's, so this is, this would be like, this is an embarrassingly complex amount of code to solve this problem. 
So let's move on from that then. Um, any questions? Okay. Uh, good. Check out. Oh, yeah, that's just the toggly code. Um, sweet. So here is an application that has state. I'm going to um, yeah, I can... cool. So we have this counter that can increment and decrement. Um, let's break this down again. So we have uh, I like sliding at the bottom for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> we have a view effectively which is, um, okay, we should actually start at the top, I suppose. So we have this, um, we need some way of like turning a bunch of events for clicking the increment event and clicking the decrement event into what the current count is of those. So the way that you do this in um, cycle land is you can, like we have this um, observable stream. So taking in DOM, and when we do a dom.get decrement.click, once again, that's an event stream, and I'm mapping over that. When you click decrement, map over each event and just return negative one. And it's the same thing for increment, map over that and return positive one. It's a plus there, an explicit plus. The really cool thing is now we can start getting into like more complex patterns of like merging observables together. Um, using the cycle.rx.observable.merge thing, it takes in each of those streams and then will return you a new observable that is the combination of both of those observables. So if I log that out, dot map log. Maybe. <laughs> One of the best parts of Cycle at the moment is that it swallows errors and I don't know how to make it stop. See, there we go. Oh, hey, that, that, no. Um, Everyone wants me wants to watch the speed to find again, don't they? Um, it's kind of definitely one of the downsides of uh, string programming is that um, can't, it's much harder to just like get in there and put a console.log in. Log is not defined. I disagree. Sweet. So we can see we get one, 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 five ones, negative one. And now the cool part is, so we have that stream, we're going to see that ones and negative ones. We have that stream, and now uh, that observable, I suppose. And so we need to take that observable of ones and negative ones and turn it into the current state. And so the way that we do that is by, um, we have this line here, we go action dollar, action, oh, uh, this dollar thing. It's a soft convention for indicating that a variable is an observable in the same way that you say, um, like, for item in items, where items is an array of items, <laughs> you would say for item in item dollar, where item dollar is an observable that spits out items every so often. Yeah. That's why the dollars are in there, just FYI. So the count, the current count, the count observable, is the action observable starting with zero and then scanning. So we start out with zero and then scanning over each of the events that the action observable emits. So since it's just emitting ones and negative ones, we start out, total is going to be zero. Scan is the same as reduce or fold. Uh, does anyone not know how reduce works? Okay, sweet. Inject. Yeah, inject, yeah. There's another one in Ruby as well. There's another alias for reduce. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this just adds uh, adds them together. So it'll start out, if we start out with zero and then I click on the thing and get one, then it's going to be zero plus one. And then if I clicked on the decrement thing, then it would be zero plus one plus a negative one and so on. So we're building up the state of our application at any given time just based on the events that have happened so far. We don't need to store any state about like what happened. All that we can do is we can say, this stuff happened and I want to transform it into this current state. And then, so we return this DOM thing where we have this count observable map over it and we get um, the create HTML for each of the things and it just changes count to count. And it's really, really simple to like build cool reactive stuff with this. Like, I, I, this might seem trivial to y'all, but I find it really cool that I can be like, um, message or count. count. And then if I declare this function, message.
notice that it auto reloads and does it. It's pretty sweet. Um, so now when I do that, ooh, low medium, I have a bug there for a return. Hmm. Ah, oh, it probably just hadn't saved. This is the great thing about auto reloading code. You never know what's reloaded. I'm going to reload that manually. So, what happens to the screen Yeah, uh, it's a really good question that I don't fully know the answer to. Um, as I said, I can't really trace the uh, execution in uh, Cycle.js app yet, so I don't really understand. Um, it seems to me that it's done lazily and that it wouldn't need to, like, I think, yes, it would keep around all of the stuff forever, so potentially it might, I don't really know the connotations of, like, memory in regards to really large observables, but they seem to be... Uh, Super, like I mean, has, this is the closest analog for this type of programming is actually Haskell string programming, and uh, my understanding of like string programming in general is that it has really sensible ways of addressing like memory usage of having large streams. But there's probably someone more educated on that that could comment. I think like environments like this tend to just keep the, the current state of the observable ones. Yeah. Uh, but you can use them modified so that you can put journal at the same time. Yeah, sweet. So um, I'm just going to show you a few of the things that I've been doing now, like the part that I got really excited about, um, CycleJS and so their example goes on to build this BMI calculator with like sliders and stuff. Uh, so I weigh 68 kilos and I like 174 tall. So my BMI is 22.46. We can have a look at the code for that. Um, so this is kind of cool. Oh yeah, sweet. So at the moment, I'm just gonna make this bigger because we don't really need to see it anymore. Um, so. I have this main, I have a stream of um, change weights, so whenever the weight slider changes, I map that to get the um, like float value out of it from whatever starts, oh, they have a range that you provide them with down in here, so you say range min 40, max 140, and it will just give you the number between that on the slider, which is really sweet. And then the state of the application is um, we combine the change weight stream and the change height stream, and we do the BMI calculation inside of here. So that's like really cool. So we have two different asynchronous things happening and we can work with them and effectively as like, it's not actually a synchronous way, but we can write code that is totally oblivious to the fact that those things happen at different times and we don't need to worry about if one happens we want to do this, if one happens we want to do that. It just says, give me the latest change weight and change height and then I'm going to return this weight and height in the BMI. And so inside of here, inside of our actual main thing, we um, take the current state, which is going to be weight, height, and BMI, and then we return some HTML, um, shows the current weight, shows the current height, shows the BMI. Um, that BMI status thing is very much the same as my message for the phone. just return some stuff based on like one calculation. I find it really cool that like I don't need to ever worry about what the application was before, I just need to worry about what it is going to be right now. Um, so that's like, yeah, that's a bit more of a complex example. Um, I'll show you what I got up to last night though. Things got a bit more interesting. Um, uh, do, do, do. I wonder if this is like all things, all bad code that I wrote the night before, potentially not going to work. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just cycle tomorrow. No, hold on, cycle tomorrow. Oh uh, yeah, so the, re the part where you refactor it in the example is the part where I was like, this is amazing. So this is um, this is my new refactored, I'll just go one further actually. This is my new refactored entire application. So we have this main function, takes in the DOM at the moment, which is a virtual, like, virtual DOM thing, passes it into this intent function, and the intent is pretty much saying, how does my user intend to interact with my application? In my case, I have these two observables, the change weight dollar and the change height dollar. That gets passed into this model function, 
the model function is responsible for turning the user's intention into the current state of the application. So it does that by combining those weight and height streams, forming the BMI calculation, which is also extracted out. Um, it's there, which is really sweet, some responsibility principle all over the place. And then it returns the view, which just takes in the current state, renders a slider for the weight, renders a slider for the height, renders the BMI, and that's real. I find that really simple, expressive code personally. Um, and I find it really, really cool. You can see this DOM coming in here, right? But it's kind of like, where does that come from? It comes from what you return out of this function. This DOM here is the same as that DOM there. And the current state of the DOM is your previous calculation. And it just flows through like that. And since it's an observable stream and it's returning observables that get fed into other observables that then have their own observables and then you can combine observables and stuff. Your entire application ends up just being this cycle of observables and things only need to change when they when things actually happen and the state actually needs to be updated. Um, let's see if my, uh, where did my browser go? Yeah. yeah, so this is what I was working on last night. So I'm working on this blog system where you can um, effectively like it's a canvas and you can drag things around and you can create posts and like link them to each other and stuff. It's a directed graph of a blog instead of an array effectively. And so I implemented dragging and cycle. It's lagging because I'm on my laptop, that makes me sad. But um, pretty much this this was a bit of a headache. The reason it drags off to the side is just because I'm not mapping from the uh, browser coordinates to the SVG coordinates. Um, but yeah, so the first time I tried to implement this, I ended up um, taking the like mouse click events, I have a stream of when you click on something and a stream of when you release something, combining them together with the current mouse position and then just like setting the post position to be the mouse position if I'm dragging it. And that was really great. I would click on something, drag it, and then I'd release it and it would snap back to where it was before and I'd be like, crap, I have to actually have, th there's no state in this application or at least the state is just what I pass through. So it means that in order to actually you have to turn that stream of I clicked on something, I released something, I moved my mouse around into the position of the posts purely using functions and data and those operations. So I can show you guys that code if you want. It's not it's in dire need of some refactoring, uh, but yeah. So start at the bottom. Have my main function that returns view model intent. This is like a pattern that Cycle expresses this view model intent thing. So you'll see it a bit. So for my intent, uh, I have this drag post thing, um, which is mapping whenever I click on a post container, post container mouse down, it uh, maps that event to get the ID of the post that I was clicking on. It's currently just using data attributes to do that because it works, uh, but there's probably a much smarter way. Um, this release drag observable, which is whenever I mouse up on the app, whenever I release my mouse, um, and that returns null. So this one returns the ID of the thing I clicked on, and this one returns null. And then the mouse move, which is just whenever you move your mouse, it gets the mouse position and it starts out at zero, zero. And the posts are all of the times you've ever clicked the submit button on the create post event, just mapped to get the stuff that you took out of it which is really cool. I love that way of thinking about things. Um, so the really interesting part of this is how the dragging is actually implemented. This code is pretty awful. Apologies. Um, so, oh wow, well, I'm gonna put that on a new line for all that clarity. That does not work in function, does it? Um, yeah, I wrote this at like 11 p.m. last night. But pretty much, um, we're combining, we have this, uh, yeah. I should start here. We have this dragged post observable, which is um, <clears throat> merging the drag post observable and the release drag observable. Um, so that will be an observable of the ID of the post that I clicked or null when I release my mouse. So, yeah. And then the post positions in the current point in time are the dragged positions, the drag posts, so that stream of one or null or whatever, combined with the mouse movements. Um, it just returns that. We start with just an empty hash. This is the current state of the posts and their positions. And then um, if if I'm releasing the mouse effectively, then I um, say, well, I'm not dragging anything anymore, and I update the position of the post that I was dragging. And if I am dragging something, I just assign um, 
this this cache that I'm passing through, this object, is just a key value of the post's ID to its current position, and it gets passed into the view, which it then pulls out to find out its current position. Uh, but it does, uses computed keys just here, that's what that weird square bracket syntax is, so that um, is the ID of the post and then the current position of it. That was like really hard for me to wrangle my head around uh, when I did it, like it was just trying to like, avoid thinking about what is the current state of my application and just think about like how do I transform all of the things that have ever happened into the current state of my application. It's like a really weird way of thinking about things, but it's super cool once you start to start to grok it a bit. Um, yeah, and so down here I just have like, this is the end of the model thing that combines the post position and the current post that people have created and then just effectively assigns the um, position that I've calculated throughout all the clicking and dragging to the current post. Um, yeah. And that does that. Through lots of horror. Mostly because cycle swallows errors. So every time something went wrong, I just had undo until I could figure out why. That is that is that is cycle JS. Any questions? I'm getting like Blank rabbit and headlight stairs. Have I like managed to confuse everyone? That's only here because he throws it up once. Oh, yeah. So, so many examples you have to see in this um, DOM thing. Yeah. Presumably that doesn't have to be the whole DOM, that could be just a small portion of it. So, you should be able to compose things together for small components. Yeah, totally. And so, React has this, uh, we have down here, when we do cycle.run, um, we pass in. DOM make node driver, and then you just pass in an ID in here. In this case, I think it's passed in by just a piece of JavaScript, but it is literally just like mounting that inside of a particular ID. So React has this idea of components where like you break down your entire application into components, and that's how things get really cool. Cycle doesn't have like first class components. Um, it has it adheres to the web component standard, but it's really interesting in that making a component in Cycle, you make a custom element, and that custom element is itself a Cycle application and has its own self-contained loop going on. And so um, the, the easiest way to refactor things is really like just what I've done here, which is just breaking out functions that render things. And I really like that way of doing things because it's incredibly easy to test and to like reason about. Like you don't need any of the complex like mounting and all of that different stuff. It's just like your application say. So yeah. And presumably you can take uh, information that you receive from the server and incorporate that into a screen of events. So you know, if you have stuff coming in every website you can kind of be doing that in the background Totally. The thing that makes me the thing that makes me most excited about cycle, something I haven't actually got to do yet, is um, synchronizing with the server because it's it's really this is when the like joy of um, like why this is cool starts to come out because if I have like this current post like observable that is just all of the posts on their X Y or whatever if I wanted to synchronize that with the server it would be like current posts uh, dot on change dot uh, the, uh, this isn't real code but this is the intention uh, dot debounce so we only want to update every two seconds and then just like that would be the entire thing, and that would be like whenever the state of the application changes, but no more than every two seconds, send that to the server. And then, yeah, you could totally like um, have, you could call the server either just with polling or with WebSockets because uh, Cycle, um, you can create observables from promises and callbacks and anything else asynchronous in JavaScript land. So you could just build a really simple jQuery poll to get the state of your application and then just combine the state that the server is sending down with the state that your users are sending up and then just like combine that as another stream that you then update the server with and it would just be beautiful and declarative and just work. Yeah. Um, it, this is, I, I feel like this is probably a relatively confusing dev talk, but I highly recommend that everyone um, goes through the basic example page on Cycle if you're interested in this. I'll post the link in um, devs afterwards. But for me, just going through the code and like writing out all the stuff myself was enough. Like once I, once I got the checkbox thing working with like the clicking up and down, I was like, oh my god, this is so cool. And then, yeah, like from when I got dragged and everything, I was like, oh, I can, ah, oh, I'm a brain. Yeah, totally recommend going through the pain of like forcing your brain to learn about thinking in this pattern. Yeah. And this is pretty much a, um, uh, 
browse the site. Version of example of a trend that's very across front end and server side computing. Because if you think of these observables as a write only log, an append only log of data, and you're synthesizing new write only logs by merging those streams continuously. That's exactly what's happening with some of the server side technologies like uh, Kafka. Mm. Uh, so this is a, it's a universal pattern and this talk of um, observable to maybe muddy into the water. But yeah. That's essentially what's happening if you're converting all these things over time. You're just writing them down one thing after another and then the, the simple structure is providing you a way of um, merging the state of the stream over time essentially kind of reducing across a number of different mm -hmm. things to get uh, yet more streams of synthesized data. And it's it's interesting when you actually start thinking about things in terms of that analogy, because like I think it is really important. Like cycle isn't the technology does not matter. The idea does, the pattern does, and like the fact that a miniature cycle component is just a cycle app just has the same thing going on. And this like model view intent sort of paradigm that I showed you all, that's just one way of slicing your application. Like I, I could just add as many functions that there could be model view potato intent and I can just do whatever I want. And that makes sense in this land. And when you start thinking about things in terms of like asynchronous streams that you can do functional stuff on, if you think about Twitter, for example, what you see on Twitter is a stream of like updates and that stream is composed of like all of the people that you follow and all of the updates that they perform and like they go through I bet a lot of effort in order to like have that be a really seamless representation but in reality a lot of the systems that we work with actually are this way at a natural level and we abstract on top of it in order to like get away from the fact that they're streams and try and think about things in terms of like a linear deterministic order but yeah if you just let go, man. Just, just live with the streams. It's much better. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.